event in our series of discussions on the three decades of economic reforms in India. We've had a, a, a previous discussion um, in September 2021. The previous, uh, before that, uh, after that, we had one on the power sector last month. And today we are going to discuss the fertilizer crisis in India. Our speakers are Professor Vikas Raval, my colleagues Prachi Bansal, uh, Suresh Garimella, uh, Sunit Arora, and Suvidya Patel. Professor Vikas Raval will moderate the discussion, and we have uh, four presentations. So over to Professor Vikas Raval. Hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm essentially going to play the role of moderation and not really speak very much. Um, what we are discussing today is um, is uh, based on a lot of work that uh, uh, people associated with our, people who are part of our research group uh, have have been undertaking for some some time now. Uh, the way uh, we would organize the presentations today, uh, in fact, uh, we have four presentations rather than three. Uh, but the way these presentations are organized are as follows. We'll start by with a presentation by Prachi, who will give us an overview of how, you know, the three decades of policies in the fertilizer sector, what has been, what have been the major changes and, and their impact, giving us a long-term perspective of what the reforms have meant in uh, on uh, you know what has been the, the 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 focus of reforms in the fertilizer sector uh, then uh, i will request suresh to come in and give uh, give us a, a sense of the current nature of crisis as some of you might be aware uh, over the last one year or so, India has faced a severe crisis in availability of fertilizers. The prices have been rising, uh, and there's been a lot of uh, turmoil in the in uh, in respect of availability of, of fertilizer, causing also a lot of distress among farmers. So Suresh is going to talk to us about this crisis, how this crisis is related to the sort of long history of uh, reforms in the fertilizer sector, and uh, what what uh, has it meant uh, in over the last one year, one 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 and a half years. Then we will have two presentations, one by Sunit and another by Suvidya. These are all the presentations that are based on work. Uh, so Sunit and, and our colleague Pavan have uh, led teams in Madhya Pradesh, uh, looking at the impact of uh, these uh, shortages and, and rise in prices on farmers in villages in Madhya Pradesh. And Suvidya and Ankur, in fact, are joining right now from uh, Sivani in, in Haryana. And they have been as part of their fieldwork in Haryana, uh, looking at uh, how the situation has evolved uh, uh, during the the rabi sowing season and and now. Uh, so so they are actually speaking to us from from Haryana. I'm not going to. So that's essentially the layout of what we're going to do. Start with the long term then look at the immediate problems and then go on to uh, getting some understanding on, on what is happening on the ground. Uh, I do not want to take more time because uh, these presentations are substantial and will uh, need your attention. I just want to take one minute for people who are not familiar, uh, just to give you one uh, piece of information which would be useful as you, you uh, listen to the the presentations that follow, that when we are talking about mineral fertilizers, chemical fertilizers, there are essentially three nutrients, three major nutrients that plants need, nitrogen, phosphate, and potash. And the fertilizers that they will be talking about, urea is the major nitrogenous fertilizer, diammonium phosphate or DAP is a fertilizer that gives nitrogen and phosphate, uh, single superphosphate SSP is a phosphatic fertilizer and muriate of potash is the potash, major source of potash. 
uh, uh, my colleagues will tell you more about it, but I just thought it might be helpful for people to know these uh, these terms and what, what MOP and DAP and, and urea are about so that you can make sense of what they are going to be talking about. So with that, I will uh, stop here and uh, invite Prachi to make a presentation on the, the, the history of reforms in the fertilizer sector. So over to you, Prachi. Thank you, Professor Rahul. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, let me just share my screen and start right away. Yes. So um, I will be talking about the fertilizer policies in the post-liberalization period in India. Uh, uh, let me just give, briefly give you an origin idea about the origin of fertilizer policies in India. And they basically originated during the time of green revolution when uh, there was high use of hyv seeds high use of uh, pesticides and other chemicals so uh, green revolution essentially paved the way for use of fertilizers uh, during this time fertilizers were uh, actually given the status of schedule b industries and for uh, the future expansion of these uh, schedule b industries or fertilizer industry was supposedly to be taken by the public sector the during this time, there was no budgetary subsidy on fertilizer. From early 1943, from 1943 to early 1970s, uh, no, no budgetary subsidy uh, existed. Only price controls were maintained. In 1975-76, as the oil crisis happened, there was uh, an increase in our future uh, in our foreign exchange outgo, and there was a need to. Uh, subsidize both imported and domestic fertilizer. Before I give you a long-term overview of the fertilizer sector, just a few things to keep in mind that India relies heavily on imports to meet the nutrient demands for crop production. We, and we import our entire potash fertilizers, muriate of potash, MOP. We import phosphoric acid to manufacture DAP in India. In fact, India is the world's largest importer of phosphoric acid. We import natural gas for urea production. We have some of our own and we import uh, a lot. We also import other ready-made fertilizers. A lot of this uh, would be talked about by Suresh, but this is just to give you, uh, just to tell you that how uh, reliant we are on the imports. Uh, the different phases of fertilizer policies in India so pre-liberalization, we have this retention price scheme. The idea of the retention price scheme was actually to promote domestic production of fertilizer. And I'll talk, I'll talk more about it as I as I'll go ahead. But uh, urea remained under the retention price scheme or RPS until 2003, whereas the PNK fertilizer, so PNK fertilizer are the potash and phosphorus fertilizers. They were under this scheme only till 1991. After 1991, a conscious decontrol of fertilizer, of, price, of fertilizer prices started to happen, which uh, took forms of different policies. First, the concession scheme, which ran from 1991 to 2010. And post 2010, we had the nutrient-based subsidy scheme. Please note that in both these schemes, urea was out of the purview and urea had a different set of policies and urea still, even today continues to be under uh, price controls. So only fertilizer under price controls and uh, the, other for, the prices of other fertilizers have been decontrolled. I'll walk you through each of these uh, phases uh, now. The first phase, the retention price scheme was, uh, uh, the retention price scheme basically regulated the prices and distribution of fertilizers. Uh, as I said, it started in 1977. The, idea of the retention price scheme was that they calculated the cost of manufacturing fertilizers on the basis of use of different feedstocks, norms of consumptions of input and capacity utilization, and also recommended a 12% post-tax rate of return on net worth as component of tax. The basic calculation of subsidy came from here that the difference between the value that was estimated using this formula and a controlled level of maximum retail price was paid as subsidy to the manufacturers.
this continued this uh, rps scheme continued till 1991 and post liberalization what we see is a marked sharp change in the policy consciousness of the state uh this period saw, saw a shift from uniform price policy and controlled prices to a regime of decontrolled prices for phosphorus and potash fertilizer the argument that was given was by this joint parliamentary committee that was set up in 1992 and they argued that uh, potash and phosphatic fertilizers are mainly used by rich farmers are used for the commercial crops and therefore we can afford to decontrol the prices of these fertilizers as a result of this wishful thinking prices soared and they increased so much that the government actually had to immediately intervene and in reintroduce some form of price control which they called the ad hoc concession schemes this first attempt to decontrol actually was sort of a partial decontrol that happened because during this time uh the, the decontrol that they the uh the decontrol that they give that they did during this time was uh was set back by keeping the prices at a much higher level than they were under the retention price scheme so the overall impact of this scheme was that there was an increase in retail prices of fertilizers other than urea there was a slow down in the use of non urea fertilizer there was an accentuation of the nutrient imbalance and there was no reduction in the fiscal burden of fertilizer subsidies the only thing that you did was that you actually increase the prices of fertilizers and control them at a much higher level what happened to urea or in during all this time was that after 2002 2003 that is when the retention price scheme um, was finished and urea came under different policies we started we uh, we hoped for increasing domestic production of urea so many steps were taken we shifted from nafta as a feedstock in urea production to natural gas as a feedstock there was uh, we tried to ensure an increase in the supply of natural gas there was an expansion of pipeline network uh, introduction of gas price increasing the efficiency of energy consumption but during all this time the production that the capacity uh, of urea production that was increased was actually increased primarily by the private sector about 50% of the installed capacity of urea production was by the private sector and this is a marked change from the policy consciousness that we had during the early 1950s or before the liberalization period uh, it's no more the public sector which was driving the increase in production capacities successive urea policies after 2003 were actually focused on creating conditions to eventually decontrol urea prices the idea was that let's make urea production efficient so that eventually you can decontrol urea prices you have not been able to do so because it has been politically not feasible but decontrol of the phosphorus and potash fertilizers was completely done in the nutrient based subsidy scheme that was introduced in 2010 now this scheme covered different kinds of fertilizers and while urea was not covered other nitrogen based fertilizers were covered under this under this scheme the main idea of the scheme was that the subsidy given to the manufacturers was delinked from the international prices and cost of production and the fertilizer manufacturers were given the freedom to set the retail price of fertilizers and the system of government regulation of prices of fertilizers in other than urea was completely dismantled since 2014 indian prices of dap have also been significantly higher than the international prices a substantial top up in the form of nutrient based subsidy over and above the decontrol prices has meant that while the manufacturers and importers have made windfall profits fertilizer farmers have been paying very high prices for dap let me just show you the rise in prices that has happened because of the nutrient based subsidy scheme the price of dap more than doubled from somewhere around 9000 uh, 9000 rupees a ton in 2009 10 to just one year to 20000 rupees per ton and then it eventually became 25000 per ton in 2018 19 dap when we started in, at the time of liberalization dap was about 1.5 times as expensive as urea in 2018 it has it had become about 4.5 times as expensive as urea the price of muriate of potash mop has also increased from about 4500 uh, rupees per ton to about 12000 rupees per ton in just one year and had remained at that level for a long time now 
interestingly, SSP, the uh, superphosphate, which used to be cheaper than urea, even after liberalization, even until 2010, and was the main phosphatic fertilizers used by the poor farmers, became 1.44 times as expensive than urea in 2018. So this NBS actually hit all the PNK fertilizers and you know hit the farmers very badly. Now this diagram illustrates which uh, what I'm uh, trying to say here. This black line shows the Indian prices of PNK DAP and. Uh, Look, during 2010, when we did not have NBS, so NBS started during this time and the Indian prices started to rise and they, we, uh, they even surpassed the international price. The green line is the international price. So we even surpassed the international price for fertilizers. And uh, you see this red line shows that what the fertilizer manufacturers were getting. So they were getting, they were allowed to set whatever price they wanted to plus they were getting the subsidy from the government. So this whole shaded region is the region of the profits that they were pocketing. Now, having uh, gone through all these policy changes and the argument always given by the state was that we are trying to reduce the subsidy or increase the production or improve the nutrient balance. What has really happened to production and consumption of all these fertilizers? So let's look at the production and import of DAP. And you see that there has, uh, there has not been any increase in the production of DAP during this time after 2010. We are more and more reliant on imports. And uh, here, I want to, uh, here I want to share an important fact about the Indian DAP manufacturing. As I said earlier, we are the only ones to import phosphoric acid and make manufacture our own DAP. Post, 2000, post 2000s, we have about 30% of our capacity of production of DAP uh, being underutilized. So we have underutilized capacity, but we are not making use of those, uh, you know, use of that capacity. We could have, for example, imported uh, phosphoric acid and manufactured our own DAP, but uh, th that is not happening right now because the ready-made DAP is more cheaper. What about urea? The production of urea has also, as you can see, not increased much. So all these shifting from uh, uh, feed and after to feed uh, to natural gas and extension of pipeline network, they may have improved the efficiency, but they have, it has not resulted into any significant increase in the production of urea. We are, as you can see, more reliant on imports. Now consumption. The consumption of uh, these fertilizers also show a very lopsided pattern because DAP, MOP, and SSP have become very expensive. It is urea which is driving the uh, consumption. Farmers are using more and more of urea because that's all that they can afford. Now, uh, like these were the major changes that happened in terms of the, these are the major policy changes that happened in, in after liberalization, but there were a few things that happened after the NDA government came into power. And this was uh, specifically one which, which uh, you know, needs to be mentioned here, neem coating of urea. So under the new urea policy, the government made it mandatory that all domestically produced urea should be coated with neem oil. The manufacturers and importers were allowed to increase the price of urea by 5% to cover the cost of this neem oil coating. Now, why do we use neem oil? The argument that was given was that neem oil works as a nitrification inhibitor. It will slow down the conversion of nitrogen into nitrates, which are highly soluble, and it will enhance the loss of nitrogen through leaching. So basically, it will improve the nitrogen use efficiency. The slowdown of nitrification was expected to result in higher yields and reduction in consumption of urea. Now, if one would review the literature on the use of nitrification inhibitors in other countries and as international practices, uh, there are chemical nitrification inhibitors that are used. There are biological nitrification in inhibitors based on crop rotations and international intercropping. India is the only country to have used something called neem oil herbal extract kind of thing to uh, control this to, to control uh, the loss of nitrogen. What has been the empirical evidence of this policy? So 
a number of experimental studies are done under control condition and they found that under control condition a little bit of improvement in name code uh, in nitrogen use efficiency happens but the biochemistry effect of this is not known and once you move to the field conditions the impact of neem coating on yields and nitrogen if use efficiency is insignificant now why did i mention this was that this neem uh, th this practice of using neem coating has actually led to a spurious pra practice of people using vegetable oil and other kinds of oils to coat uh, urea so that you know and this is actually uh, a, some sort of pseudo science that has been promoted in the name of uh, neem coating the other and the last most important policy change that has happened during this time uh, after post liberalization is the direct benefit transfer of subsidy the fertilizer subsidy now it was rolled pan, pan india in march 2018 and the direct benefit transfer in fertilizers presently is different from direct benefit transfer in other goods and services right now the subsidy is not going to the farmer it is going to the fertilizer companies eventually it may go to the farmer the subsidy is transferred on the basis of actual sale of fertilizers recorded through point of sale machines rather than on the basis of dispatch of fertilizer produced or imported the major point to note here is that the sales that happen through the point of sale machines are linked with aadhar cards and land records and only buyers who have this aadhar registration or land records and soil health cards are entitled to buy the subsidized fertilizers under the dpt scheme the main purpose of this scheme is to actually target fertilizer subsidies and eventually limit the fertilizer and time entitlements to farmers uh, my colleague sunil will talk more about the uh, field evidence regarding the dbt and uh, i think i'll stop here thank you if you know before i invite uh, suresh essentially what uh, prachi's presentation shows that the liberalization in the fertilizer sector has had this peculiar uh, trajectory in which government has decontrolled all fertilizers other than urea resulting in a situation where fertilizer manufacturers were charging full prices to to farmers and on top of that uh, government was giving subsidy against the, the, that sale so farmers are, the manufacturers are essentially uh, getting a huge profit on account of uh, not just what they are charging from farmers but this additional top up subsidy that is being provided this has worsened the use of fertilizer imbalance in a manner that the urea is being used even more which not not only has environmental implications but it has meant that the total fisc expenditure on subsidies has not fallen and that really reflects the the fallacy of uh, economic reforms in in the fertilizer sector and in fact in i would say in agriculture as a whole where even if you look at the argument that was given for uh, the bringing about the reforms which in this case was to bring down the fertilizer subsidies even that objective is not met and you actually have a situation where everything that you used to rationalize it that you know uh, the fertilizer subsidies are causing imbalance in nutrient use the fertilizer subsidies are resulting in higher fiscal burden all of that is worsened and on top of that farmers are made to pay high prices in addition to this what has happened during this period is that india compromised its production domestic production capacity of fertilizers and became increasingly import dependent so we have a deregulated environment in which prices are linked with world prices we have a situation in which private companies are in the lead for for procuring importing fertilizers and distributing it and our own domestic uh, production capacity is compromised now uh, let me invite suresh to tell us how this uh, sort of in this background how this background actually led to the crisis that we are facing today and uh, you know what this crisis has been like so so over to suresh thank you professor vikas welcome everyone uh i uh, let me share my screen start start the presentation
कंट्रोल एल टू या या थैंक यू नाउ सी ओवर द लास्ट वन इयर वी हैव विटनेस्ड सिग्निफिकेंट शॉर्टेजेस इन द अवेलेबिलिटी ऑफ फर्टिलाइजर्स दीज शॉर्टेजेस आर सीन इन ऑल ऑफ द मेजर फर्टिलाइजर्स इंक्लूडिंग डीएपी MOP and urea there has been a sharp increase in these prices of fertilizers internationally which in turn has put pressure on the prices domestically uh, where we can see the reactions of the government where uh, during the crisis it tries to increase in enhance the subsidy or uh, bring in bring back the uh, price control policy also but there have been what we have to see is in the last one year there have been significant reduction in imports it is generally understood that there have been reduction of imports is because of breakdown of supply chains container crisis etc but i would like to argue that there are other reasons for this crisis in uh, for, uh, for this availability crisis india is increasingly dependent on imports which also makes india vulnerable in terms of its food security just if you look at the data in 2021 21% of a total uh, urea used in india is imported 55% of the dap is imported and 100% of muriate of potash or mop is imported now as prachi also was talking about domestic production and imports the domestic production and import if you look at in the last 10 years the red uh, the pink gives here about the import and the blue gives the production the production of dap and urea as well has been has seen only a very marginal very marginal increase whereas more than 50% as i was saying of production or uh, of dap is relied on imports and the imp and the reliance on urea or import of urea has been consistently over the years increasing there and 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 the production capabilities are underutilized or there are major investments to increase the production capabilities also if we look at the uh, at this graph here which gives the availability of dap and mop uh, between january 2020 and november 21 in comparison with the corresponding months in 2019 since march 2020 there has been consistently there have been shortages shortages in availability of dap and mop there is a slight between november and uh, january there is a slight availability in positive but overall if you see there is has been there has been a consistent shortage of availability of dap mop and not just dap and dap and mop it is the same in the case of urea as well it it just starts from march 2020 and it has been consistently low over the years now one of the reasons also is the increase in international prices between jan 2021 and 2022 urea has increased with 213% dap around 128% mop or 93% then with ammonia over 295% etc etc and these increase in prices international prices can be seen where urea has increased since july 2021 as seen with the case with ammonia which increased uh, slightly started earlier in march and april 21 and dap since april 2021 the same with phosphoric uh, phosphoric acid then then in 2020 these prices started increasing post in march and april 2021 and what we have to see importantly this graph shows here is the decrease uh, is the decline in import of dap between jan february and march april there has been a consistent decline in this graph shows the monthly import of dap in 2021 in relation to 2019 the pink graph gives your pink line gives the monthly import of dap in 2019 and the blue one uh, blue line gives about the monthly imports in 2021 in between january to march and april there has been a sure decline in imports and a sharp decline in imports in august and september this this also resulted in uh, in the crisis of availability of fertilizers in october and november 2021 during the rabi sowing season now if we see uh, the just in the case of dap between january to june in 2021 in comparison to 2020 the 
the decline in imports is 26% and between Jan and specifically between Jan to March, it is 72.41%. And at the same case, with August to September, it is 80, nearly 80%. Whereas between July to December, it was 29.80%. And as I was talking about, it is not just because of the supply, uh, the breakage in supply chains. What we can see is in this imports, there, there has been a huge decline uh, as the government increased the subsidy, enhanced the subsidy in May and October of 2021. The in May, rupees 700 per bag has been enhanced in uh, the case of DAP in October, uh, 438 per bag. This, this enhancement in May and October, we can see that the imports raised in June, uh, July, uh, June and July of 2021 at the same after October, November and December in 2021. It's once the subsidy was increased, the imports also increased. Now, primarily India is also mostly dependent on four or five countries mainly for import of DAP, urea, uh, uh, MOP and so on and so forth. In the case of DAP, it is primarily relies on China and Saudi Arabia. When last in 2021, 37% of DAP was imported from China and 37% from uh, Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Uh, this in 2021, we imported 63 million tons uh, uh, of DAP, in which 17 million tons was from China, uh, China itself. In, in the case of urea, this urea, uh, the, uh, 35 percent of our urea imports are from China, and uh, and uh, earlier we also relied more than 25 percent of our imports were coming from Iran. The the light brown shade here gives Iran, and the and the later uh, this this shade gives here about uh, this color gives here about Oman. Primarily, what we have to see is uh, India, which used to import more than 25 percent after the sanctions of on Iran in 2017 and uh, 2017 and tightening of them in 2018 and 19. Our imports are, have nearly stopped from Iran, and after that, our reliance on China for urea uh, for urea has drastically increased. In 2020, out of the total one million tons which we imported, 34 million tons were from China. In the case of MOP, we rely mainly on Canada and Belarus, and in 2021, we whereas we imported 31 million tons, 10 million tons were from Belarus, and 7 million tons were from Canada. The, uh, the brown year uh, shows Canada, the yellow year uh, shows about the imports uh, from Belarus. 31% in 2021 alone were uh, from Belarus. Uh, for, uh, for production, on domestic production of DAP in India, we rely on the imports of phosphoric acid and rock phosphate. Phosphoric acid, mainly from Jordan and Morocco, uh, the same is the case with uh, rock phosphate. It is also primarily from Jordan and Morocco with other small countries giving their shares. Now, what we have to see here is this reliance of uh, this reliance on these imports has has also made us dependent dependent on other countries such as China, Russia and and uh, Ukraine to an extent. Now, in the in 2021, Due, because of the increase increase in the price of the thermal coal, China has stopped production or, or, or reduced the production of both urea and phosphatic fertilizers and has halted its exports till June 2022. Prime, what we have to see here is China is, is one of the biggest exporters of fertilizers. It accounts to one third of the global DAP trade and one tenth of the global urea. And in, as uh, as we were seeing uh, the imports, India imported in 2021 35 percent of its total from urea, uh, urea from uh, uh, of urea and 37 percent from DAP. With this halting of export by China and also in the uh, also by Russia, Russia is also one of the biggest biggest exporters of uh, biggest exporters of urea across the world. The whole Europe is re is dependent on. Russia for natural gas and the fertilizers, whereas because of the uh, because of the drastic increase in prices of natural gas in 2021 and one of the main ingredients for production of urea, Russia also has restricted the production and halted the export of fertilizers till June 2022. 
and it, it banned it completely banned stop the export of ammonium nitrate till march 2022 and which probably would be extended now now as we are talk uh, in the case of belarus belarus is the uh, india is in india is one of the big uh, one of the biggest ex importer of uh, importer of Bel uh, of mop from belarus and belarus is the second biggest producer of mop in the sanctions on belarus by us eu and canada on belarus kali mainly the export arm of belarus potash company has led to increase in the prices in the later price the sanctions by uae by the us eu and canada have started in june 2021 with the tightening of the sanctions in august 2021 and china and canada which is one of the first biggest producer and another biggest producer of potash has promised to increase the production but it could it would not be able to match the volumes of production by belarus and because of the sanctions on belarus the uh, the whole potash export potash export uh, export has been impacted indian companies have deals with uh, the belarusian com uh, companies till december 2021 which lapsed and then no new deals have been have been signed yet as such making uh, uh, making the import of potash uh, vulnerable uh, in india vulnerable in the import of potash now uh, apart from the, uh, this crisis in apart from the uh, russia and belarus and sanctions also the recent russia ukraine and crisis also also led to the further increase further increase of price uh, further increase of prices uh, of crude oil and natural gas which has imported and the, uh, the physical disruption of the supply chains uh, uh, for exports from russia and ukraine and as you, as europe relies on russia for natural gas and fertilizers automatically there would be competition for other countries which would lead to lead to further increase of prices of the of the fertilizers what we can see about the response of the government in over the time what we can see is there have been mostly knee jerk reactions by the government whenever there is a crisis whenever there is a sudden increase in prices or imports reduce it incre it increases or enhances the subsidy but there have been no major capital investments to ensure or increase the domestic production capabilities of the prices it has also brought in the price control by setting a reasonable price the price has not been mandated but it says a reasonable price quote and quote which uh, under which the dapm open you has to be sold though india has increased or had to had to enhance the subsidies only in the last year twice we you can see in the budget 22 and 23 the allotment for fertilizer subsidy has been 25% less than the revised estimates of 2021 and 2022 now apart from this also the in the recent times the government has brought in the ipnm bill or integrated plan nutrition management bill which replaces the fertilizer movement control order of 1973 and fertilizer inorganic organic and mixed control order of 1985 basically fertilizers which are part of the essential commodities will be now taken out about the, from the list now and quote and quote this integrated plan nutrition management bill has been to look at to uh, to mainly control and look at the price management and and the differentiation of agriculture use and industrial use of fertilizers has been discarded from this new ipnm integrated plan nutrition manage uh, integrated plan nutrition management bill also the energy crisis across the world be it coal in china or or uh, natural gas in russia is precipitating and continuing this energy cri uh, this crisis has led to the shortages of availability internationally and uh, and with obvious domestically and this primary now in order to ensure that farmers get uh, 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 there are, there is availability of fertilizers at affordable rates india needs to look at long term investments increase the subsidies and immediately look for uh, having alternative sources have long term deals with different countries to ensure that there is a uh, there are reserves and continuous supply of this of these uh, of these fertilizers also also what uh, also if we don't take immediate action 
or they don't take responsibility and uh, immediate action to ensure availability of fertilizers of farmers at affordable rates. We will see seeing a replay of this crisis, which happened in October and November of 2021 during the uh, during the sowing season in Rabi, which my, uh, and which will we we might see the replay in the sowing season in Karif in the coming time and in the Rabi in the later stage. Thank you. Thank you, Suresh. So essentially, we see that uh, the the structural changes that had been introduced through the policies of uh, economic reforms in the fertilizer sector, deregulation in particular, uh, uh, and, and this increased reliance on imports have created a peculiar you know, situation of vulnerability in the context of fertilizers, which are strateg of, of strategic importance for food India's food security. And we find that in the, over this period, when there has been a lot of uh, disruption globally in availability of fertilizer, uh, that has a direct impact on, on what is happening in India. Uh, what is unfortunate is that the response to this crisis has been essentially knee-jerk reactions in terms of you know, bringing back controls at the moment, uh, introducing this new bill, but not really making any strategic uh, taking any strategic decisions in terms of securing raw material supplies, improving utilization of, in fact, installed capacity of fertilizer manufacturing. So, you know, uh, the installed capacity of uh, Indian fertilizer plants is, is, is very, uh, the capacity utilization is very low. So improving those things, I mean, all of that has not been done. You have essentially just sort of done ad hoc increases in subsidies, brought back controls and, and hoping that uh, the situation internationally would ease out. But now let us look at what has been the impact of this. You know, over the last two seasons in particular, in at, during Kharif and uh, Rabi of uh, this, the, the current uh, season, there, was, there were se se severe shortages in availability of fertilizers were reported. There, this was a major news uh, uh, at the time of sowing. So what is what was it? And, and how was, uh, 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 what was the impact on the ground? Uh, how was it felt? What were the kinds of problems that farmers faced? Let's listen to that first from uh, Sunit, who along with Pavan and others has done fieldwork in Madhya Pradesh. And then from Suvidya, who's, who's going to present the fieldwork from, from Haryana. So over to Sunit first. Uh, thank you, Professor Raval. Good evening, everyone. Uh, let me just share my screen. Um, so in order to assess the impact of changes in the availability of fertilizers on agricultural activity in rural India, we conducted short village level studies in the state of Madhya Pradesh in December 2021. The two study villages are the village of Avli in Hoshangabad district and the village of Bastoli in Morena district. Now, Avli falls in one of the major wheat producing regions in central India. It is irrigated by a canal from a nearby reservoir. It is also very well connected to large commercial centers and the cultivation process has undergone extensive mechanization. Bastoli, on the other hand, is a relatively backward village in terms of amenities. Uh, irrigation is mainly done through tube wells uh, private tubers, and this manual labor is still prominent in the cultivation process, and there is weak physical connectivity with large commercial centers. Uh, there's a town nearby, which is called Kelaras, which is where most of the shops are there, but uh, the connectivity is mainly uh, dependent on private modes of transport. In terms of cropping pattern, wheat is the main rubby crop in Avli, and is cultivated on around 95% of operation holdings. Paddy and soybean are important Kharif crops. And there's a summer crop, which is the moon green, which is grown during the bridge months between Kharif and Rabi. In terms of, uh, in Abbasoli, mustard and wheat are the main Rabi crops, and Bajra is the main Kharif crop. There is no prominent summer, uh, summer crop cultivated by the villagers in Bastoli. Uh, in terms of fertilizer use, we found that Avli has a much higher use of average use of fertilizers as compared to Bastoli. So, um, Higher potential incomes have actually fueled more use of fertilizer in southern Madhya Pradesh, which is where Avdi lies. 
in almost all crops, we can see that uh, um, uh, cultivators in Avi are using much higher amount of fertilizers. And the main fertilizer used are DAP and urea. Uh, for paddy cultivation, there are some other inputs which have been used by cultivators in Avi. In terms of procurement of fertilizers, there are three primary channels for obtaining fertilizers in Avi. First is the cooperative society in the village. So members can avail, can take fertilizers on credit and then the payment can be made after the wheat produce is sold to the state government. The limits are enforced through the use of land records and Aadhaar cards are mandatory. The second option is to procure fertilizers from an input shop in the village by making cash payments. And the third option is to uh, transport them from the nearby city of Hushangabad by making cash payments. In case of Bastoli, uh, the two main channels of uh, purchasing fertilizers are cooperative societies in the nearby town of Kelaras. Here, the, again, the members can take fertilizers on credit and the payment can be made after the producer is sold. The second option is to buy it from a counter of the district marketing officer in Kelaras. Here, the, uh, the limits on the fertilizers are enforced the use of Aadhaar card. So on one Aadhaar card, you can procure two bags of urea and two bags of DAP, but the payment has to be made in cash. So uh, what we found during our survey is that societies actually were rationing the distribution of fertilizers and the limits were enforced through the, through, based on the availability of Aadhaar cards and land records, which is uh, mandated by the DBT scheme. And the farmers were forced to actually buy from private shops at much higher prices. So if you look at this table, you can see that the price of a 50 kg DAP bag in a village society was at rupees 1200. Whereas when bought from private shops, you will have to spend between 1250 to 1400 rupees for the same brand. For urea, the prices uh, in the society were 267. But in private shops, the prices hovered between 300 and 350 rupees per 45 kg bag. Now, a common substitute for DAP is NPK, which is a combination of three nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So a 50 kg bag uh, of NPK was actually selling for around rupees 1500, depending on various compositions. Now, the NPK can actually be used in place of DAP. So this was a preferred alternative by the farmers in the face of shortage of DAP. Almost all farmers uh, reported difficulty in procuring DAP before the sowing season in uh, sow sowing season of Rabi in 2021. There was substantial delay in the arrival of fertilizers in the cooperative society in both the villages that we surveyed. So the other alternative was to purchase it from private shops. Uh, many of the farmers actually made the purchases in cash as opposed to buying it on credit from the society. However, large farmers found it relatively easier to procure fertilizers as the shopkeepers also prefer selling it in bulk to farmers who can buy large quantities in one go. Large farmers also reported procuring fertilizers much in advance of the sowing season because they were able to get the information regarding the shortage through their connections with input dealers. We also found that almost all large dealers had reduced their sale of DAP due to unavailability of shock, uh, stocks by about, uh, to around 20% of what they sold last year. There was also refusal on the part of some of the sellers to get into selling urea and DAP this time because of increased risk of government inspections and interference. Uh, as compared to large dealers, small shopkeepers actually found it much more difficult to procure the stocks and some of them were not able to sell at all during this chubby season. Due to a shortage of DAP, farmers in Avdi actually had to make a switch to another alternative, which, is, uh, which was NPK. But the, uh, but the switch to NPK actually increased the cost of cultivation due to three main reasons. First is the direct, uh, di uh, direct difference in price. So a 50 kg bag of DAP would cost them between 1250 to 1400 when bought from a private source, whereas they would have to spend around 1500 for the same amount of NPK. So this was the direct difference in price. Moreover, due to uncertainty regarding the impact on yields due to unavailability of DAP, farmers uh, ended up using more larger amounts of NPK. So this led to another difference in cost of cultivation. And also to aid plant growth, there was use of some other inputs, again, to make up for the uncertainty in the impact on yields. So this meant a substantial increase in cost of cultivation, plus the mode of payment change from credit to cash. In case of urea, we found that for the second round of application, which is done around 20 days after sowing, there was acute shortage in the availability of urea. Even though the prices had increased much before, still there was, uh, it was unavailable in the village societies as well as in private shops at the time of the survey. It did become available later on, but there was a delay of around 20 days um, for the second round of application. 
In terms of access to fertilizers across classes of farmers, we found that large farmers actually had a better deal. So they were able to purchase uh, fertilizers in advance. They had prior information through their connections and networks. Input dealers also sold their existing stock to customers who had paying capacity well in advance of rubby sowing. So the sowing happened in November and farmers had procured, uh, large farmers had procured fertilizers in end of August. Uh, this means they also bought fertilizers before the prices actually went up. So they were able to procure fertilizers before the prices reached around 1400 rupees per 50 kg bag of DAP. Small farmers, on the other hand, faced increase in the cost of cultivation due to unavailability in the village society, and they had to procure alternatives instead of DAP, which also meant that we found evidence that they resorted to short-term borrowing to meet the expenses on fertilizers, which they had to procure by making cash payments. In other years, they usually buy it on credit from the societies, and they are not, uh, they're not forced to make the short-term borrowing. To some of our major findings, we found acute shortages in availability of DAP and urea uh, during rubby season 21, 22. Farmers had to switch to more expensive alternatives like different compositions of NPK. And the mode of payment changed from credit to cash payments, putting an additional strain on almost all, uh, all classes of farmers. However, this increase in cost of cultivation, um, along with this increase in cost of cultivation, large farmers did have uh, slightly better access to fertilizers. And we did, we found evidence of short-term borrowing by small farmers to meet this expenditure on fertilizers. Thank you. Thank you, Sunny. Uh, may I now request Suvidya to take over and tell us about the experience in Haryana. Uh, as I mentioned, Suvidya and Ankur are, are still there. They are doing the field work and they, they, they connect us literally live from the field. Thank you, sir. So this is a preliminary work, which is based We need on your uh, sound to be volume, uh, Subhidya. Am I audible, sir? No. Barely. Just be closer to the mic. Is it better now, sir? Hello? Well, just about, but yeah, carry on. I suppose people should just raise the volumes of their speakers. I'm afraid Suvidya is 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 uh, you know speaking from a dharamshala in Sivani, so we'll have to bear with this. Uh, maybe people can uh, increase the volumes of their speakers to to compensate. But Suvidya, carry on. Okay, thank you, sir. So this is a preliminary work which is based on a sample survey of the farmers in the two village of. Um, Givani district and a survey of farmers in the APMCs of Ambala and Karnal. So along with this, we have interviewed eight fertilizer dealers and two distributed various locations in Haryana. So the table shows the shortfall in the uh, sales of urea and DAP in the surveyed stores. Most of the stores reported a fall in the fertilizer sales in the range of 15 to 55% in the rubby 2021-22 season as compared to the latest rubby season last uh, rabi season. So the shortfall in the DAP was higher than that in urea. So in such a situation of shortage, it is important to look at how did the farmers and the fertilizer traders dealt with a crisis on the ground. So due to the shortage of the fertilizer, quantitative restrictions were imposed and the farmers were given only limited bags of fertilizers. We found that this rationing started from the month of September for DAP and from October for urea. Also, a limit of five bags of urea and DAP per person was initially imposed. And this, is, this limit was further reduced to two bags per adhar and even one bag at some places at the time of serious shortage. So the limit was arbitrary and was decided by the local administration, which included the ADU of the reason. And whenever the stock of fertilizer would arrive at the dealer, the local ADU or his junior officials would come to supervise the distribution of fertilizer. And they used to check the stock and the sales register of the dealer. So the situation was so bad that the local police had to be used for crowd management. So most of the farmers reported that the entire family had to stand in queue for several days to get a limited amount of fertilizer bags and still could not manage to get as much as bags, bags they, they needed. And on the other hand, some non-farmers who managed to get some bags of urea sold, uh, sold it to the farmers at the rate as high. 
high as 400 bags per bag. You know, village provided some relief to the local farmers as they could get in. Sorry, Suvidya, so we've lost you. Let's just wait for a while. If... So with there. Maybe you should log out and log in. So with that, I can't hear you. So with that, we've lost you. Yeah, now you are. Yes. I was talking about the uh, does, just just one second so with there uh, does ambika have your presentation in which case she can perhaps share the screen and you can turn off your uh, video etc it might become easier it's, i have turned off the video for the connection only but yeah but if if the presentation is available uh, here the presentation is visible now i am okay carry on carry on So um, the first uh, first thing was the rationing of uh, due to the shortage of the urea and DAP. The first thing was happened was quantity restriction, and the second was the alternative products was introduced in the markets. So due to the shortage of DAP and urea, many alternative products were being sold to the farmers initially. And the farmer had to shift to SSP through uh, although they preferred DAP, but within uh, but within few days only the SSP was also uh, out of stock. And the farmers were then offered NPK. However, there was only limited stock of NPK as well. And the price of NPK increased from 1185 rupees per bag to 1485 per bag. So at the so at the time of severe shortage, many new products such as bio DAP, liquid DAP were offered to the farmers. And as the advertisement poster shows, these products were claimed to be the substitute of DAP. One of the uh, one of the alternative was a liquid DAP, which is a solution of various chemical in the liquid form, and the price of liquid DAP was rupees thirteen hundred per liter, and half of the liter was needed for an acre. So, in a crop such as mustard and wheat, the farmer were asked to soak the seed in the in this liquid and then sow. However, it could uh, it could not become popular among the farmers, and its use remained very low. And in cotton, the some farmers use it by applying through drip irrigation. And, and one interesting alternative was the bio DAP. So it is a kind of manure which contains less amount of phosphate and uh, phosphate in the soil along with some kind of bacteria. And all the fertilizer shop have reported that it was the first time that they were selling these products. And the fertilizer prices was, uh, was to such an extent that farmers had no other option but to purchase these kind of products. And dealer also pushed this product without knowing its effectiveness because they were uh, earning a large margin in such products. Like while the while the cost is co cost price of one such bio DAP was around 400 per bags, but the selling price was between 1,000 to 200 per bag. So they are having large margin in these products. So uh, in case of urea, uh, IFCO has the called nano urea, which is in liquid form instead of granular form. So it has to be sprayed in on the plants and is observed through the leaves. So while developed by IFCO, nano urea was available at all the uh, retail shops in the sample. And um, although the uh, farmers preferred to use urea in the granular form, the limited amount of sales of nano urea took place. So the uh, shortage of fertilizer also led to the interlocking of different input markets. So, it, so taking advantage of the shortage and the crisis, the distribution uh, distributor and the dealers forced the buyer to purchase the other inputs such as seeds, pesticides or herbicides along with the DAP and urea. 
so we came across with many such incident like such like many such combination during our survey so at some places dap was bundled with sulfur while at some places pesticides or herbicides were bundled with dap as well as urea so this interlocking took place at the level of distributor as well as retailer the distributor would supply a higher stock of urea to particular retailer if he agreed to sell higher stock of other inputs mainly pesticides so while some of the retailer were able to sell this extra stock of input separately many asked the farmers to buy such inputs compulsorily along with the fertilizer so at the retailer level this kind of interlocking was more prevalent in ambala and karnal and relatively less in bhiwani so uh, but the uh, but uh, ifco this practice was uh, uh, so apart from ifco every um, uh, private shop uh, this type of practice was prevalent among many brands uh, so um, at the time of shortage some of the farmers had to take the help of their commission agent in procuring in procuring the fertilizer which further strengthened the interlocking of input market with the sale of outputs so interlocking of agriculture produce market with inputs and credit market is a serious problem and the crisis accentuated the this problem so interlocking was very prevalent in our sample so most of the fertilizer dealers gave preferential treatment to their regular and large farmers in various ways sunit has also mentioned about this so one of uh, one uh, uh, in different forms like in one many retailer reported that they kept around one third of their stock for regular farmers and distributed on the rest through the rationing system secondly information of arrival of new stock was provided to their regular farmers by the dealers so the retailer the, the retailer get the information regarding the arrival of their stock and they informed their preferred customer in advance about the date of arrival while the rest of the farmers would come to know the availability of stock much later so so most of the large farmers uh, in our sample have reported that they managed to get that all the needed bags at once through the dealers and most retailer reported that they were up, even matlab this type of preferential treatment was given to farmers by their shops but also uh, other kind of preferential treatment by the political party political influencing parties as well like most retailer reported that they were approached by various political influencing or administrative official to provide fertilizer to certain farmers which they had to oblige like for example one retailer were asked to provide fertilizer by the ad only and one another by the dsp uh, and so on so in the recent few days farmers have been rushing to buy another important farm input which is fuel so many farmers are now stocking diesel in large quantities they were expecting a rise in fuel prices and therefore want to buy as much as they can before the price rise so the picture shows a drum with a capacity of 220 liters of full of diesel and such drums are used by farmers to store the fuel so they are paying rupees 600 to buy such drums so in our uh, survey uh, in our matlab village survey in bivain district a large number of farmers have stored at least 3 4 such drums of fuel while those who uh, own, own thresher or combined harvester have stored more than 20 drums so um, sudden increase in the demand of such drums has led to increase in the price of drums to rupees 900 to 1200 so um, so uh, one farmer has also reported that these drums are now being sold at the petrol pump itself so uh, this shows uh, the uh, this shows that in the situation when there is a likely shortage or when there is a speculation of about prices people naturally start to stock so the large farmers have already started the effort to procure the uh, stock of dap in the com uh, for the coming kharif season so if the supply is not properly maintained it is very likely that the situation will be the same or even worse in the coming season as well thank you sir thank you suvidya thank you very much for this very useful presentation so both the presentation from madhya pradesh and from haryana show us how the the not only the the there were shortages these shortages 
are then dealt with in peculiar ways by imposing rationing, by making use of Aadhaar card mandatory, by making use of uh, introducing you you know uh, identification with land records, and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, you know interlocking that. You can buy a fertilizer only if you also buy pesticide. If you can buy a fertilizer only if you buy seeds from the same person. You can buy fertilizer only if you go through a commission agent to whom you are then committed to sell your crop and things of this kind. And these are then used to disadvantage, in particular, the poor farmers who have to buy these things at uh, at um, you know in small quantities. But you know they don't have access to credit and 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 so on and so forth. So so implications of these shortages are felt in a differential manner, with small farmers being more adversely affected. So I think that basically completes the story that we wanted to cover from the long term perspectives that Prachi presented to the the macroeconomics of the current crisis presented by Suresh, and then these two very nice presentations on on the, the, the impact on in the villages that were seen. Uh, with that, uh, I would invite uh, questions. There are already some questions in the chat box, which I would request the, the presenters to, to look at, and they can start taking them uh, on one by one. Uh, there are some questions for, uh, for Prachi. Uh, uh, in the meanwhile, may I request others to to start posing questions. Um, and if you are, uh, since, uh, I mean, it's a group of uh, 50 people, many of whom, uh, 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 if you have uh, uh, questions that you would ask in person, if you, you raise your hand, we can perhaps unmute you and allow you to, to speak as well. But, but uh, can we start with Prachi responding to some of the questions that have been raised? Yes, I can only see Nachiket's questions. Uh, can I? Uh, yeah, can you respond to that? I think that's the, those are the questions for you. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, so yes, uh, so the question is that neem coating is, uh, the argument for neem coating was to divert it for non-agricultural, uh, to deter the diversion to non-agricultural inputs. And uh, if there is any evidence of fall in such uh, diversion, so first, I would like to say that the diversion to other, uh, other than industrial use, other than agricultural use of urea is very little. There is industrial use of urea, but that that was very little. And the stated objective of neem coating, the two main objectives, the first one was actually inhibiting the to use it as a nitrification inhibitor, so to prevent uh, to improve nitrogen use efficiency. And so, that has not been achieved. That's the first. Yeah, just just one second, uh, Prachi. In, in case of uh, neem coating, one also one related question is also that uh, you know nobody knows how how much where is all this neem oil coming from. If it were the case that all the urea of the country was being coated with neem oil, how much neem oil is required and where that neem oil is coming from is something that nobody has an answer to. Yes, uh, so there is also that issue. So yeah, um, let me just give the number for that. So uh, uh, the government states that you need at least eight hundred grams of neem oil per ton of urea, and to do that, it requires an annual supply of over twenty six thousand tons of neem oil, which in turn actually needs point two six million tons of neem seed. And the quant amount of neem trees that we have, we can only cover about 15% of our total urea production. So, in fact, you know, we feel so that's why you have all those spurious vegetable oil, this oil, that, uh, that oil being used because you don't have so much of neem oil also, even if it were to increase the yields. There are also some uh, a couple of questions about the, the, you know, the direct benefit transfer. Uh, uh, you know the the in particular you know how the land I mean whether there is a provision for linkage with land records is it there in the regulations or is it just being implemented so I suppose that's a question that both Prachi and uh, Sunit and uh, Suvidya might want to answer on how what was the nature of uh, this insistence on linkage with land reforms is it uh, uh, mandatory or is it just being imposed locally 
So the stated objective in, in DVT is that you link it with Aadhaar card, with the land records and with the soil health cards. Now it has as Sunit and so with their may answer also that it's different for different uh, states right now because they're, you know, making it pan India. Uh, maybe it's Sunit and so with can answer that better, but on statement, they have uh, all these. In the stated policy, there is a linkage with land records. There is, a, there is, of course, a linkage for land record. And that's how they actually want to ensure the entitlement that per acre, how, uh, you know, large farmers or small farmers, how much they can have. Yeah. Sunit, do you want to say something on this? I will also answer Jikit's question to me. So even within the state, like we, um, I'll just switch off my video. I think the internet is unstable. Yeah. So even within the state, we found very different uh, versions. So in one part of the state, which is, uh, we found that it was actually uh, enforced through the presence of land records. So for one acre, one acre of land ownership, you could get two bags of DAP and two bags of urea. In Bastoli, however, we found that the only mandate was mandatory requirement was the presence of an Aadhaar card. So based on Aadhaar card, irrespective of if uh, how much land you own, you could take in one go, two bags of DAP and two bags of urea. So this actually links to the local, uh, the way local administration is working right now because the policy, the infrastructure is available, but the policy is not playing out in the same way in different parts. That also links to the um, supply and demand mechanism. So in Avdi, there's much higher use of fertilizer. So the shortage was greater. And the other important point is that Bastoli is in Morena district, which is close to Gwalior which has very high political connectivity. So the fertilizer rakes were, um, more fertilizer rakes were available in Morena and earlier. So there the shortage was slightly lesser than RV. So that also sort of made the administration, uh, the policies of administration stricter in RV and land records were used to enforce limits. Yeah. Well, there is a related question from Yuko about whether people, does everybody have Aadhaar cards? That I suppose more or less people, People do have other card, most of them. Uh, yes. But, uh, but uh, uh, there is a limit to how much you can get per other card, and and uh, I suppose by amount of land. Uh, we have uh, here uh, Indrajit Singh, Joyati, Professor Chandrasekhar, Barbara. Uh, I don't know if any of them has a question and they would want to unmute and 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 speak. Hello, am I audible? Hello. Yes, yes, Vidya. Sir, to the last question, like as Prati said, it was not informed. So land record was not required in case of Haryana for the purchase of fertilizer, but only Aadhaar card was mandatory to buy the uh, fertilizer. Without Aadhaar card, it's not available. For somebody who's uh, if I am I yes. audible? Yes, yes. Actually, yes. I have seen two questions here, which. Uh, talk about that uh, domestic production of our, our fertilizers in india is also mainly relied on imports from other countries uh, from other countries so it's uh, since we are always uh, will there be any sufficient uh, will there be any uh, self sufficiency so on and uh, I, I, uh, yeah will be will there be any self sufficiency and we will we'll always be dependent on imports uh, so what can we do or any other alternatives for synthetic fertilizers? It's largely, if I look at all the questions, what I understood. See, at, at the end of the day, one thing to be understood is fertilizers are still prepared from non-renewable natural resources. So there is no end. It is not nothing like there isn't. It's continuous or uninterrupted or extreme co-occurrence of like unlimited supply of these fertilizers. That That is not the case. But also, also the rock phosphate uh, reserves if there is no immediate threat that these reserves are going to be finished. They are there for next uh, a century or two centuries. But what primarily I also want to point it out or look into it is earlier mm -hmm. three, four decades back when the public sector companies were the prime uh, uh, prime in the production and you, uh, in, were the prime companies in the production, they also they help develop a technology. It, it, I, I think across the world, mostly India is dependent on this. Uh, in, only India uses this technology where the rock phosphate is transfer is is uh, is, uh, is made into phosphoric acid, so that for, it becomes easier for uh, the cost of production or the the cost of transportation etc. becomes easier. So that that is brought in, in brought into India and fertilizer is pr uh, produced in India. 
see the, these ki- these kind of new innov- uh, these kind of new innovations or these kind of other aspects are largely missing in the later times we are primarily dependent as as, as it is understood uh, as from prachi's uh, presentation also we have seen that over the later times internationally the uh, already produced dap was price was lower than what was being domestically produced we still relied on imports and now suddenly if, when there is a huge spike in, in the prices international prices or any other reasons or any, or any other geopolitical reasons across the world since we are dependent over uh, uh, dependent on that there is an immediate threat in the crisis of availability so that that i think that immediate crisis would not have happened also the large public sector companies also had long term deals and per ca- per capita consumption of fertilizer vis a vis per acre production is, is in india is relatively higher these also those so depending on these fertilizers and continuously or reducing that usage trying to uh, low going among the farmers and more uh, more schemes or more uh, explanatory things or for judicious use etc all these programs could, should have to be developed over the years or should have to be continuously worked on it hi comrade indrajit you have a question hello yes hello uh, can you hear me hello yes. yes we can hear you okay okay i was just wanted to convey to you that uh, because haryana also is one of the states where shortage of fertilizer has affected the farmers a lot recently when the rabi crop was being sown and there were you know long long queues were seen and at some of the places the fertilizers were distributed from the police stations you know <laughs> so uh, now uh, that is only one observation i am conveying the uh, i mean magnitude of the problem and secondly now on 2nd of march the state budget was presented by the chief minister who holds the finance portfolio also he has uh, uh, advised the farmers to go for organic farming and uh, for 3 years he has promised that government will compensate the loss of yield uh, in case of uh, those who will be adopting organic farming and uh, even central government budget also was uh, pleading for what you must have read as zero budget farming so uh, i think apart from their other obligations uh, they slowly and slowly are going to stop the supply of fertilizer through the uh, as a state responsibility and it may be uh, switched over to the Uh, private players to make the fertilizer available at more and more prices and uh, slowly and slowly there shall be no subsidy at all thank you thank you comrade yeah yeah uh, there is a uh, question from professor chandrashekar about um, whether the shortage is because of uh, uh, imports from china being cut off uh, suresh do you want to explain that the, the whole china can think it No, last one year, uh, there's not been. Uh, we we got the imports from China. China has halted exports from December twenty twenty one. Has reduced production after November and halted the exports from December twenty twenty one till. Uh, I, I'm sorry, you know, I I missed I I missed that bit of your thing. So what exactly explains the? I mean, okay, we we have Ukraine and what's going to happen in the future. what really explains this shortage we had over the last year and a half or a year or so the i i think mostly mostly because of the energy crisis and increasing the prices of coal and natural gas uh, over the years the international prices of this uh, fertilizer shot up and traders did not import it because it would be it would be uh, they would have to sell at losses for uh, losses in india uh, for uh, for example yes, The, uh, the belarus sanctions the belarus sanctions uh, uh, created a shortage of dap right no 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 sorry no belarus uh, uh, from belarus we import mostly uh, muriate muri- of potash the potash shortages were mainly a result of uh, yeah 
No, no. So, so, no, so point is, traders, traders could have hiked domestic prices. No, I mean, there's no. no. The government has this policy that they have to be sold at reasonable prices. So it is not clear that you have to be sold. It is not written in as an order that you have to be sold at this price only. But they cannot hike it more than twelve hundred. For example, in the last time before the before the increase of subsidy in May twenty twenty one, the uh, prices internationally increased from twelve uh, hundred to seventeen hundred or more. Then the uh, then seven hundred rupees of subsidy was increased in May. After that, the imports increased primarily. उंटमेंट and and government were, was has been late uh, they have made that announcement and they tried to intervene but it was it has been late that is why we see that decrease of imports in august and september and okay. sat, and again the hike in imports post october november okay thank you so much yeah subhash surendran padmaja if somebody can unmute her yes ah uh, um hello professor ah uh, suresh ah uh, I congratulate everyone for the good presentation, especially the field insights. But what I understand is uh, what Suresh said as the recommendations on strategies which have been you could pursue. Uh, we have worked on those strategies with Ministry of Fertilizer in 2020 and 1920, and we figured out it is much complicated than what we perceive from an academic perspective. Especially, we often look just as the prices uh, as a manifestation and make strategies based on prices, but uh the producers the situation especially in uh with this fertilizer is pretty complicated from international scenario one is due to the reason that the raw materials are in very few countries and uh, yeah. it's 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 very difficult and those uh, the import the switch in import from domestic production to import also happens because of our joint ventures there also it's uh, it's it's much complicated than just drawing based on the price strategy i would also say that you are giving less credit to the government uh, the, they they are trying hard because we worked with them for some for a while and we found out that they are also trying hard to figure it out how to do that but it's much complicated uh, than just looking at the prices you could just look into how those industries operate and there is an often tendency of comparing uh, the prices of urea dap and k uh, but these are completely different uh, sectors sectors in a way they operate in a different way that whole dynamics is different so look into those dynamics to understand what's more happening uh, and it's to just put it shortly it's pretty complicated than uh, the usual inferences drawn in this thank you subhash uh, i think the while the point you make uh, must be uh, I, i see the point you're making but also has to understand that in fact i think what what's coming out of these presentations is exactly opposite of of this that is that during the post liberalization period this entire uh, sort of uh, history of deregulation has been one where the strategies for procuring fertilizer have been left to market signals where you basically said that you know private uh, importers depending on the price situation would decide what they uh, import and how much they import where they import from rather than a framework in which government took the lead in strategically identifying sources of raw materials and production you do that now uh, you know when there is a crisis so when there is a crisis you bring back price controls and you start scrambling for what to do but you have undermined your capacity to strategically plan for obtaining and and you know knowing that uh, this is a critical uh, requirement and that uh, we do not have raw materials and the, and precisely as you said you know the raw materials are available only from from uh, uh, some countries india to make strategic uh, the, uh, decisions on how you are going to do it and this is in sharp contrast from what how it was done earlier when india in fact you know this idea of using phosphoric acid to 
you know, to get for phosphoric acid manufactured in source countries, import phosphoric acid rather than uh, phosphatic rock and manufacture DAP in India was quite an innovation in some ways, you know, uh, uh, to, 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 to beat the fact that we didn't have raw materials and importing phosphatic rock was going to be expensive. You found a way of doing it. Similarly, strategic investments abroad was something that was done by the public sector, by IFCOs and so on. Something that was, you know, undermined in the process of privatization and deregulation. You are now trying to do it again, but you know, it's 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 a bit late. I mean, this this is uh, the 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 situation you've been you find yourself in is a result of what has been done over the last three decades. So that needs to be understood. Uh, I, I just want to give a small uh, thing for, uh, as Professor C.P. Chandrasekhar sir was asking. The DAP rates uh, by, by were paid by the farmer was 1200 and the government subsidy was 500 in April 2021. And the later, the uh, so the companies used to get around 1700 for uh, per DAP bag. When the later prices increase, uh, uh, DAP price increased from 1900 to two, uh, 1900 or over, over 2000, the government increased the subsidy of plus 700 rupees. So the subsidy was increased to 1200, so that the uh, prices will be bought back to 1200. That is when in June and July, the imports increased. And later, DAP price uh, shot up far, uh, more further uh, to more than 2000 or 2500. That Then again, government has stepped in to increase the subsidy for 438 under DAP and more and 100 under NPK. Any other questions? You can raise your hand, uh, write the question in the, in the, well, there is a question from Nachiket. Uh, what are the long-term recommendations to address the fertilizer crisis? Now that's a difficult one, but I mean, I would say one is that we have to get out of this fixation to, you know, uh, design fertilizer policies with the objective of bringing down subsidies. We have not managed to do it in the last three decades. We have only worsened the situation. We have created more distortions in the fertilizer policies and we have not reduced the subsidy. So, so one is we have to get out of this fixation and on the other hand actually realize that this is a critical uh, input. We cannot not have a strategic uh, perspective about this, have a plan uh, and, and uh, if Fertilizers were not available, not made available to farmers at at, remunerate, at reasonable prices. The the distress this would cause, the 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 intensification of agrarian distress that this would cause would be is something that would be uh, you know uh, 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 something that we have not yet seen. So so you know one needs to first and foremost realize the the strategic importance of fertilizers as a sector, uh, understand that these have to be subsidized, that these have to be subsidized in a manner that uh, uh, both ensures uh, that these are available to farmers at reasonable prices and a balance in nutrient application is maintained. Uh, so rather than you know providing huge subsidy on urea and providing no subsidy on, on DAP and things of that kind has to be, has to be stopped. And uh, India needs to make uh, investment in production capacity, needs to find uh, ways of obtaining raw material and, and produce fertilizer. Uh, the reliance on, uh, uh, on, um, on, uh, on imports, particularly based on price signals, is not necessarily a good idea. Uh, Professor Ghosh has a question. Yoyati. Uh, yeah, you know, in fact, I had put it in the chat because it's just, uh, I mean, it might be my ignorance, but do you have any evidence on the impact on yields so far? Because obviously there has been this shift to much more nitrogenous. There's been uh, you know, reduction in use of fertilizers now for several years. So is there any evidence on the yields? Uh, uh, Prachi, do you, we have that evidence on... Uh, we talk about that? have an evidence on fertilizer productivity, if I could say that. Yeah, uh, yeah. that is uh, uh, the, the productivity uh, per unit of fertilizer input. Uh, yes. you can oh, it. yeah, you have that. So yeah, that would be good. So, um, okay, now, rather than sharing it, I'll just uh, read out the numbers. Because... 
would be for me to do. Yes. So uh, India has the lowest fertilizer productivity compared to all the countries in the world. And that we've computed for wheat, maize, and rice. And uh, so we we use very high amount of fertilizer. We use very high amount. So Prachi, can you again just, you know, what is India relative to say the global mean or something else or other developing countries? Or? Yeah. So, um, so globally, the fertilizer productivity would be some 35 points. Points as in uh, the kg of crop divided by kg of nitro, uh, the total fertilizer. <laughs> and India would be somewhere around 16, which is the lowest. So 75 and 16? 35 and 16. 35. Okay. Okay. And, and, uh, what Less than half. half. Russia would be 66. So Russia would be so high. They are using more fertilizer, but they're also having very high yields. Yeah, so Indian, basically Indian efficiency is very low. Very, very low. And it has obviously worsened because of this problem of, you know, the distortion becoming worse. This uh, over-reliance on urea, increasing over-reliance on urea has, has made it worse. That's quite clear. This is a really startling difference. So what explains this? Why are we so bad at this? <laughs> over time, we have, uh, we, uh, we have totally deteriorated our uh, nutrient use, uh, the balance. We are focusing more and more on urea. And there are crops which specifically requires phosphorus, which specifically requires potash for their growth. And that, um, that total imbalance that has happened has really, you know, the potash and phosphate has basically become impossible. I mean, too expensive for any uh, for poor farmers. So if you are going potato, you need potash, but you just can't afford it. So you just put more urea, and it basically leaches into the ground most of it. So, so, so then no, I'm just thinking in terms of the time trend. So let's say 20 years ago, were we better relative to the global average, and it's deteriorated significantly since then, or? has this has structural feature of it? Uh, yes, 20 years ago, we were far better because uh, we were using comparatively a, a balance of use was better. I'm so sorry that I don't have these numbers ready. I, <laughs> it's there in the paper, but I just don't have it ready right now. That, no, but this is a very impressive piece of work anyway, all of you. Congratulations. Thank you, Jyoti. Uh, any other questions? Right. I think if we've dealt with most of the questions, can we then request Jessim to take over and close the session? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Vikas. Thank you, Prachi, Suresh, uh, Suvidya, and Sunit. Uh, also, a special thanks to Pawan, um, who has been uh, working, as you have seen from the slides, he has worked with um, all of them uh, at the background. He works on data. He has also done field work. Uh, mm, I, I, on behalf of my colleagues here at uh, SSCR, I would like to thank the audience, all of you for coming in and uh, listening to our presentations. We had uh, some very interesting discussion. Uh, this fertilizer group will continue this work uh, and in the coming days, uh, both uh, looking at policies, uh, data, uh, secondary data, and going back to the field and looking at the situation uh, we will continue doing this and uh, we will come back with uh, presentations and our findings. Thank you very much. Uh, as I said in the beginning, this is the third presentation uh, in our series uh, on the uh, three decades of economic reforms. We will have more uh, uh, presentations coming in the, in, the, in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, we, we, we look forward to your participation. Thank you and good night. Um, Jason, so if you don't mind, can I share just uh, a small graph for Jayati, uh, for Professor Ghosh? Yeah, 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 yeah. Please go ahead. Yes. So this is the fertilizer productivity uh, that you see. So the yields divided by the kg of nutrient or fertilizer that you're using for maize, rice, and wheat. And you see, while the world average is here, we are in all crops at the lowest level. And countries such as Russia or China, which use comparatively very high quantities of fertilizer, are uh, 
you know, have much higher yields because the balance is much more better there. Oh, I'll just stop now. My God, this is devastating. Thank you, Prachi. Thank you. Thank you, Prachi. Yeah, yeah. Thank you once again. And uh, until our next presentations. Yeah. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.